It takes a pretty special person to become the President of the United States of America. They must not only demonstrate leadership skills, decisiveness, and possess a bit of luck, but they must also possess the ability not to let the job overwhelm them. In the video today, we're going to be looking at a list of presidents who lacked these qualities and subsequently found their tenure in the White House more of a curse than a blessing. Now, as you watch this video, please do keep in mind a few things. For one, there are no particularly recent presidents on this list because I think it takes a while for political passions to cool. And also keep in mind that best and worst is not a popular contest. For example, there are some really bad presidents who remained popular during their term and afterwards, while there are some good presidents uh, not so popular during their presidency or afterwards. In the video, we're looking at the president's accomplishments, or lack thereof, in relation to the amount of time that they spent in office. And of course, we are taking into account the geopolitical and economic situation of the country and the globe at the time. And finally, just to say that we're only looking at presidents who served more than two years in office because it wouldn't really be fair to list people who didn't. So without much further ado, let's get on with today's video. And tied at number 10, it's Benjamin Harrison, 1889 to 1893. The grandson of the ill-fated ninth president of the United States, William Henry Harrison, the cold and humorless Benjamin Harrison rode into office largely upon his pledge to keep the government's promise to compensate his fellow Civil War veterans, which his opponent, the incumbent president Grover Cleveland, had obstinately refused to do. Once in office, old Ben was good for his word and coughed up the promised funds, which turned out to be the high point of his tenure. After that, things went downhill fast, especially economically. By the next election cycle, the country was in full-blown depression, and Cleveland won his old job back, defeating the very man who had defeated him just four years earlier. And also at number 10, William Howard Taft, 1909-1913. It would be hard for any man to follow in the footsteps of the larger-than-life Teddy Roosevelt, but the corpulent Taft definitely failed to live up to even lowered expectations, which was curious considering that Taft had been Teddy's hand-picked successor. The problem was that TR was what one would call a progressive, and he thought Taft would continue in that tradition. But it quickly turned out that he was an old-school Republican after all, much to Teddy's chagrin. So disappointed was he in Taft that Teddy challenged him in the primary in 1912, and though he won more states and delegates than the incumbent's president, he still lost the nomination to Taft at the convention. Never the pragmatist, Teddy then went on to run as a third-party candidate, splitting the Republican vote and handing the White House to the Democrats for the first time in 16 years. Number 9. Jimmy Carter from 1977 to 1981 Though he still has his proponents today, the case could be made that Jimmy Carter was the quintessential man in over his head if there ever was one. While a generally genial and compassionate man, what the country needed was a strong leader willing to face up to the Ayatollahs and tackle the double-digit inflation that dogged his administration. To be fair, Carter did have a couple of successes. For example, he did get Israel and Egypt to sign the Camp David Peace Accord, which brought peace to the two antagonists after nearly 30 years of intermittent warfare. Overall, though, if one were to sum up the Carter administration, it would probably be best of intentions, but a job too big for the man to handle. I'll give him an A for effort, though. Number 8. Millard Fillmore, 1851-1853 The period immediately preceding the Civil War produced an unusually large number of weak presidents, one of whom was Millard Fillmore. Only the second man to assume the presidency upon the death of his predecessor, in this case Zachary Taylor, who died just over a year into his administration, Fillmore seemed overwhelmed with the job right from the start. It's not that he made lots of mistakes, it's just that he didn't do much, other than perhaps encourage secessionists by deciding it would be a good idea to make the newest western state slave states in an effort to appease the South. In his own words, God knows that I detest slavery, but it is an existing evil, and we must endure it and give it such protection as is guaranteed by the Constitution. How's that for a man of conviction? Number 7. John Tyler from 1841 to 1845 the first sitting vice president to ascend to the presidency, upon the death of William Henry Harrison, who died just a month after being inaugurated, things did not go well for Mr. Tyler from the beginning. First, it wasn't entirely clear that the vice president could simply assume the presidency upon the president's death, creating a political crisis. Tyler won that debate, but that was the extent of his success. After that, he turned on his former supporters, vetoing their entire agenda, and got himself expelled from the Whig Party, which is not surprising considering he was a former states' rights Democrats before joining the Whigs. By the time he left office, not even his wife was willing to give him a second term. He eventually won a congressional seat in the Confederate government, but died before he could take office, ending a long but decidedly mediocre public service career. Number 6. Herbert Hoover, 1929-1933 
Hoover, perhaps in the best example of worst timing ever, managed to ride a groundswell of support into office in 1928, only to see it all come crashing down, both literally and figuratively, just a few months after being sworn in. Of course, he got all the blame for it, even though the dynamics that made the crash inevitable had been enshrined in American financial institutions long before he put his hand on the Bible and took the oath of office. What he was responsible for, however, was helping the country work its way out of the Great Depression, which he proved to be wholly incapable of doing. Hoover tried, to be sure, but by the time the next election cycle came up, unemployment stood at a staggering 25%, and Hoover was toast. Number 5. Ulysses S. Grant, 1869-1877 Any man that could command a million-man army and defeat Robert E. Lee should make an ideal president, or so one would think. But Grant proved that assumption to be erroneous. The problem was that the genial and well-meaning Grant, while a man of personal integrity, had absolutely no capacity to discern the same in others. As a result, he surrounded himself with some of the most corrupt men ever to sit on a cabinet. Worse, he was fiercely loyal, and so was reluctant to sack anyone once their indiscretions became not only public, but self-evident. Had it not been for his personal popularity, Grant is the most popular president to make this bottom ten, it's unlikely he would have seen more than one term. Number 4. Warren G. Harding, 1921-1923 If any man had less capacity to be President of the United States than Warren G. Harding, it's hard to know who it might be. Harding basically became President because he was considered handsome by the standards of the time, and remember this was the first election in which women could vote, and because people were tired of Woodrow Wilson's shenanigans. Unfortunately, he was somewhat ethically challenged and seemed far more interested in playing poker, drinking, and pursuing women than leading the country. Fortunately, the economy was booming in the 20s, or he could well have gone down as the worst president. He also died just three years into his term, supposedly of heart disease, which further insulated him from deserved criticism. Number 3. Andrew Johnson, 1865-1869 Old Abe was not known for his ability to pick competent generals until he happened upon Grant. The same could be said about his choice for running mate in 1864 when he chose Andrew Johnson, an anti-secessionist Democrat from Tennessee, to be the man entrusted with being a heartbeat away from the presidency. The problem was that once Johnson was handed the keys to the White House upon Lincoln's death, he and the Republican-controlled Congress couldn't seem to agree on much of anything. Johnson holds the record for the most presidential vetoes and for having the most presidential vetoes overridden by Congress. As a result, he ended up in a four-year-long spat that turned the post-war Reconstruction efforts into a nightmare and nearly prematurely cost him his job when he avoided being impeached by a single vote. What was old Abe thinking? Number 2. James Buchanan, 1857-1861 Okay, so he wasn't quite as bad as his predecessor in that he didn't openly support secession and slavery. It's just that old Buck, as he was known, did absolutely nothing to stop or even slow the secessionist train down as it headed towards the country at full speed. What is sad is that Buchanan had the resume to be a good president. A popular and experienced politician, Buchanan ably represented Pennsylvania in the House of Representatives and later the Senate, and served as Secretary of State under President James K. Polk. What he lacked was awareness of the dangers the country faced, or the courage to do anything about them, which is even more unforgivable than simply making mistakes. Buchanan might have made a passable president at another time, but in 1857, he proved disastrous. Number 1. Franklin Pierce, 1853-1857 Old Frank usually makes it to the bottom of most of these lists, probably because he did more to set the stage for the Civil War than any other president. What did he do? Well, for one thing, he repealed the Missouri Compromise Act of 1850, thereby reopening the question of whether slavery should be permitted in new western states, further fueling the fires of secession, which he also supported, by the way, even becoming the only ex-president to openly support the South during the Civil War. It's not that Franklin was evil. In fact, by most accounts, he was a fairly genial guy. It's just that he was badly on the wrong side of history and probably did more than any other president to make the Civil War inevitable. Sadly, he was also the only president to die of alcoholism, succumbing to sclerosis of the liver in 1869, making him about as tragic a figure as one could imagine. A bonus trivia fact. Since 1789, 43 men have held the presidency. Of them, 15 have been Democrats, 18 have been Republicans, 4 were Whigs, the precursor to the Republican Party, 4 were Democrat Republicans, 4 were Democratic Republicans, the forerunner to the Democratic Party, 1 was a Federalist, whatever that is, and 1, George Washington, was an Independent. 
So that was who we think are the top 10 worst presidents. Bearing in mind the rules at the beginning of the video, tell us what you think below. Is there someone you agree should go on the list? Someone who doesn't deserve to be on the list? Let us know. Also, if you like this video, do click like below and that really helps us out. Also, if you dig this video, you're sure to like videos on another channel that I present called Today I Found Out. I'm going to link over to a couple of videos from that channel on the screen now. Also, if you want to subscribe to it, that subscribe button on the screen now will subscribe you to Today I Found Out. You won't regret it. It's awesome. Also, videos every day, all of that good stuff. So again, thanks for watching and see you next time.